Okay, one second. Two people entered the waiting room. Oh, thank you. All right, so admit, admit, admit all. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm so sorry. We had a uh, little technical difficulties. Okay. Wait one second. Thanks for waiting, guys. Well, you're here now. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Wait, hold on. Oh, I guess I just, just let everybody in. Okay, that's good. Hi, Allie. Hi, everybody. Sorry, Hi. Um, Hi. we couldn't get on the computer, and then I was just trying to figure out our password. So actually, <laughs> those darn passwords. I know. <laughs> darn technology. <laughs> I miss the rotary, I miss the rotary phone. My <laughs> friend. When hey, everybody, not how's everyone feeling? Wait one second. I want to just make sure I've got everybody. Thanks for waiting. Was everyone waiting, just sitting around wondering what was happening? Playing games. Yes. Drinking. Drinking. We're having our afternoon drink. <laughs> Wait a second. It's noon. <laughs> I, I was late, so you're just on time. The only one. <laughs> yeah. So you won't get a truancy, uh, you know, a note. Okay. I think well, I you're worth, I bet everybody would agree you're worth waiting for. Oh, I, gosh darn it. I'm worth waiting for. I second the motion. <laughs> Thanks. You guys are in a hard group. <laughs> okay, I think that's it. Okay, good. I just didn't want to. Uh, Julie said her okay, oh, we're recording first. already. Okay, well, the good news is I'm the admin, so you don't have to hear any announcements. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be reminded to pay. <laughs> uh, all right. I just got to keep my eye on the admin, so I just have to keep my eye on. on people coming in all right see if any hi erica welcome to a newcomer to this class <laughs> hi. Oh. hi erica welcome uh, not a newcomer an old an oldie but a Thanks. newcomer to class a goodie yeah she's real old <laughs> <laughs> she's really old and young simultaneously I'm all be. right anything uh, good so good to see everybody all right, we'll get right to it since we're late. And I wanna honor everybody's time. Okay, Erica, you came in on a, a less of a personal Mishnah from Perkyevo, but a very, very important one. And a little apropos with the death of the queen and, um, the, and, and the upcoming great, great Chag of Rosh Hashanah. But um, I'm going to read to you this very, very short Mishnah. So, I think Erica's the only new person here. Um, so we're learning Perky Avos, um, Ethics of Our Fathers, part of the Mishnah. And these are the words of the rabbis around the time of the um, destruction of the Second Temple. As the Jewish world moved from Israel Temple to what be, then became Rabbinic Judaism as they were exiled all over the world for 2000 years until most recently when the Jews are coming back to the land of Israel. So these were the words around the time that the Jews were moving from biblical Judaism to rabbinic Judaism. And these are words that I think the probably the most important thing to say about Perky Avos is it is not um, designated for the time alone, but everything you're gonna learn in Avos is absolutely timeless and absolutely applicable to the times that we live in. Never irrelevant, always relevant, and there's always something very profound to be learned. So now we have a short one, but it's like all of them, very powerful. Rabbi Hanina Sagan HaKohanim Omer. Rabbi Hanina, the deputy, the vice high priest, so he was the, uh, the kind of perennial assistant to the, to the high priest. Rabbi Hanina Sagana Kohin HaKohanim Omer. Have mitpalel b'shlom shamalchut. Pray for the welfare of the government. She'il male, 
mora'a, so that's Aramaic. So ilamale mora'a means for if there weren't fear of it, for with for 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 were sorry, I'll read it in, in the book. For were it not for the fear of it, um, ish et reehu chayim balau, people would swallow one another alive. Okay, so I'll read it faster in English. Rabbi Hanina, the deputy high priest, said, pray for the welfare of the government. For were it not for fear of it, people would swallow one another alive. Okay, what are we talking about? Well, I don't know, for some reason, the first thing that came to my thought is the creator of God Bless America, who was a Jew by the name of Come on, Berlin? Guys. Irving Berlin? Berlin, right, Irving Berlin. But this is a God bless America coined by a Jewish person. But for 2000 years, um, Jewish people all over the world have prayed at the end of the Shabbat service and at the end of the Yom Tov, the, the Chagim, the holiday services, they have prayed for the Shalom, for the welfare of the government in which they reside, the government of the country in which they reside. So Jews have always had a very interesting and, and sort of um, kind of fascinating role in culture and in society in that they're always somewhat separate They've always been distinct. Um, oh, everyone should mute. And then I probably will have to unmute. One second. Okay, I guess I don't have to unmute. Okay. Um, they've always been distinct. And yet they always, unless according to Jewish law, they live in a, um, an evil government. But if they live in a somewhat reasonably hospitable government, not a perfect government, not with a president to their liking, but with a reasonable government that protects the rights of the Jewish people, then the Jews are duty bound to pray for the welfare of the government. And every week, that's exactly what we do. We pray for the, the, the welfare of the government. So on one end, religion and politics don't mix. Even at Lahayim Center, we, we are very careful not to mix religion and politics. And certainly in a house of worship, there's no place for politics. But a Jew or even religion has to acknowledge the role of government in, in securing the the well-being and the safety of the people who are part of that government. So regardless of whether or not we like the government, we pray for it. Because in essence, what we're saying is a certain degree of stability and security and, a set and basic well-being is required for things not to become chaotic kind of knowing that when things do become chaotic, when there's scarcity, where there's lack, where there's trauma, where, where there is anything that disrupts the fabric of society, Jews are usually the first ones to be blamed, the perennial scapegoats. And you don't have to look much farther than Germany um, in the 1930s when the economy was so fragile and so vulnerable and everything got turned on the Jews. So in essence, what the Jews are saying is, we're grateful. We're grateful. We do not. We don't take anything for granted. This is an incredibly important point. That it does not matter if you can't stand the current president or the last president. If you're a Democrat, if you're a Republican, it's irrelevant. The first order of the day is to be grateful for a certain measure of security. Um, a certain measure of stability and a sense of, of being free from persecution, which we should never, ever take for granted. By the way, everybody talks about gratitude all the time, and I think a lot of people do practice it, but 
you can never practice it enough. Anytime you feel discouraged, depressed, unhappy, disgruntled, feeling like you get the short end of the stick, any struggles that you have, you can always go into gratitude. And it's like the, the literally the antidote for going down the rabbit hole of whatever you're lacking, even when you're lacking something significant. Gratitude is the antidote. And the first thing that, that we learn about the, the prayer for the welfare of the government is don't take anything for granted. And in our politicized culture, where it is so totally by so so totally polarized and so almost devouring each other from within it is so important to remember wait a second first of all we have to have gratitude for the government that we have and also you don't make the prayer for the government that we say at the end of the shabbat service we never make it dependent on our attitude toward the government Without getting political, I do remember that when Trump became president, there were synagogues that wanted to stop saying the prayer for the government because they felt he was abhorrent and whatever. So they didn't want to say the prayer for the government. And the answer, at least in the Orthodox world, not because maybe Orthodox world is more conservative, but because you don't even all the more so if you're concerned about the trajectory of the government, you should pray for the welfare of the government. You're not pray, praying isn't saying I, I'll pray for you because I like you. I pray for the welfare of the government. A, because I recognize that I should take nothing for granted, not my freedoms, not my securities, not the freedoms and securities of other people. Um, I um that's okay, Julie. If you're here, don't worry about it. It's fine. Um, I take I take nothing for granted, but also I recognize that the moment that fragility, that, that vulnerability comes into the equation in society, think Spain, think Poland, think Russia, think Germany, the moment that there's instability, almost always the Jew is the first to be um, blamed and is the scapegoat for all the angst that a society feels. And also what Rabbi Hanina is saying here is 2000 years before Nazi Germany, he's saying that the human being without a government that people fear, that people have a certain reverence for, and I'll, 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 I wanna make sure we have the right word for fear uh, because there's different kinds of fear. Um, so it says, oh, so he uses the Aramaic. So they're using the word, they're really the word here is, is, is connected to the word for yira. So if there isn't a certain fear of the government, people will swallow each other alive. Now, no word is superfluous in, 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 in even, not only in the written Torah, but even in our rabbi's work, nothing is superfluous. What does it mean? Ish et re'ehu chayim bala'u. So first of all, the word for ish, if you want to say just like a, I don't know, just person, you say Adam, but ish represents civilized. Ish represents dignified. Ish, the word ish represents kind of the civilized man. That, that, that's the context of the word ish. The civilized man will swallow his neighbor. What does that mean? So swallow, I saw one commentator say, if you swallow food without chewing it, you're not even tasting the food. You're just swallowing it to, to, to get it in without, without the taste of the food. So too, under the veneer of civilization, gentility, dignity, refinement, lies an animalistic aspect of the human being who won't even chew. <laughs> he just wants to swallow you whole. Now, this is a very bleak picture of human nature, but in essence, what, he, and what, in, what, what, what is, it, it's almost like a prophecy toward the times that we're all too familiar with. Civilized man, ish, et re'ehu. What does re'ehu mean? 
A, a it means like your neighbor, your peer, your doctor, your pharmacist, your accountant, not, not, not the dregs. Well, I don't even know what, but like your people that you, you've gone to for advice, for business advice, a colleague. Now, if this doesn't describe it, like many, many different times in history, but the one that we are the most familiar, familiar with is Nazi Germany. What is, what is Rabbi Hanina saying? Ish et re'ehu chayim bala'u. The dignified man will swallow his pharmacist, his accountant, without even chewing. Meaning, what we saw in Germany was under the veneer of the most refined, dignified, civilized, um, cultured society lay an, an animal side of man that would turn on his peer and swallow him alive. So what, so what, and this of course is 2000 years before Nazi Germany, but what this is really telling us is it is, Todd, are you raising your hand? Uh, yes. Oh, okay, yeah. A uh, quick question for you about Rehu here. Is this the universal concept of love your neighbor in the sense it can be anyone or is it just your fellow Jew? You mean this version of Re'ehu? Yes. No, this doesn't, no, this is in a different context. Re'e just means um, fellow. But it also means fellow, like, like, you know, someone sort of in, you know, in your social sphere. So this is a different context of, of, of your neighbor, of your peer. Um, but, but, it, but, but it is referencing the, it, this concept of fellow that, you know, I, I mean, I didn't even necessarily read this, but I, but I read Balehu and I read Ish and Re'ehu, I'm thinking of the word Re'ehu, which is, which is, there was such a sense of having made it in society and such a sense of having been comfortably assimilated into German society and being very successful within German society and being totally like, I mean, just, just we're German first. In fact, the famous words of, I can't remember who, is we, we are G Germans of the Mosaic persuasion. Berlin is our Jerusalem. Germans of the Mosaic persuasion. Not only German first, Jewish second, but German with a persuasion toward the Mosaic faith. That was how assimilated we were. And what Rabbi Hanina is saying here is pray for the welfare of the government. Because if people don't fear it, and Yira is, 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 is alluding to um, the appropriate fear for a, for it doesn't have to be a great government, but it, you don't pray for the government of Nazi Germany. But we do pray that the government is it continues to protect us and not just for the Jewish people, so, you know, Todd, but that the, that, but, but as Jews, we pray that the government should protect us, but it's also saying when the, when the government falls apart, the Jews are the first to be blamed and please don't fall for the illusion of civility. Do not fall for the illusion of culture. Do not fall for the illusion of um social justice <laughs> because a lot there are a lot of times society is like the pig so what is the pig now we know that the pig is kind of like the symbol of non-kosher but it's so much deeper than that the pig um is the one animal in the torah that many many animals don't that, of course we know that the, well not of course but the two signs of kosher meat or kosher animals, I should say, are they chew their cud and have split hooves. Now, many, many animals chew their cud, but don't have split hooves. So chewing their cud is internal. It's the digestive system. Chewing their cud is internal, invisible. Split hooves is external. So many, many animals internally are kosher, but externally not. The pig is the one animal 
that has split hooves, looks kosher on the outside, but doesn't chew its cud. Let me repeat that because it's a, it's, it's, it's a metaphor, but it's a powerful one. Many, many animals look kosher, sorry, many, many animals are kosher on the inside, but the outside are not kosher. They don't have split hooves. The pig is the one animal that isn't kosher on the inside, but it looks kosher. And what, what, what I'm saying here is be very, very careful of movements, of, of social causes, of social trajectories, of tendencies that look very humane, very caring, very people for whatever it is. They look very kosher, but they don't chew their cud. Inside, it's not kosher. It is very, very important that, and I, I, I mean, to Todd's point, all people, but for a Jew, hmm. to never be stupid. Like David, I don't know if David always says, but he used to say that there's a 614th mitzvah. Remember, don't be an idiot, right? That was his famous <laughs> kind of whatever life. So the 614th mitzvah is don't be an idiot. Just because something looks very um, progressive, I don't want to say whatever. Something looks very, you know, uh, social justice-y does not mean it's kosher. So a Jew has to always, always, always use the litmus test, not that other things don't matter, but if that movement has a inclination against the Jewish people in any form, if within that movement is an anti-Israel sentiment, that does not mean you can't have um, issues with policies in the state of Israel. I, I, I don't like this policy. That's absolutely fine. But if within a movement that you have an affinity toward, there is a um, rejection of the state of Israel or kind of a latent anti-Semitism that bubbles underneath the surface, please remember that it might very, very well be a pig. It might look very sexy and cool and everybody's thinking everyone's doing it and everyone's moving in that trajectory and nobody's questioning, but you have a litmus test. What's the view of the Jews? Not just because we're, we only think of Jewish people, but because throughout history, the you could you could always sense the kind of breakdown of an unhealthy trajectory uh, when they were they had anti-Semitism burbling at the sur underneath the surface. So the we have to do there. There's a beautiful phrase in the Talmud. It's one of my favorite ones. It says, "Chad shehu, v'chad vehu." Okay, chad shehu suspect him and respect him. Actually, it's the opposite. Respect him but don't be an idiot. Don't be an idiot. Respect him, be respectful all the time. <clears throat> totally respectful. But respectful doesn't mean you buy into the latest movement, the latest trajectory of society use the litmus test of what's the view of the Jews. Because if it's even remotely anti-Semitic, you can, or even, I will say even anti-Israel, which again, does not mean you don't take issue with policies of Israel. It means you're against the right of the state to exist. If that's kind of burbling at the bottom, you can be sure that that is a movement that is a pig. It looks fantastic. And everyone's saying it's fantastic. And all the kids in university love it but it doesn't mean that it's right. And so a Jew has to kavdehu, respect, but always chadshehu, but always be suspicious, always be discerning, never just believe what you read. Always, I remember, Michael, you're here. I remember I was sitting with Michael and Lori, we were talking about reading, what was it, the New York Times and 
no, what, what were you so reading both sides, you know, reading both, 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 like sort both sides, so to speak, to use your critical mind to say, what am I reading here? You know, what's the discrepancy? What does the discrepancy tell me? What, what are they both saying? You, how important it is, because really, I, you, it's incredibly important as a Jew to look at Jewish history and to understand that there are two, there are many, many, many different forms of, of crises, but sometimes it comes through persecution of the Jews. And sometimes it comes from when things are very easy for the Jews. So you, always, you, you have to always be extremely smart, but you always respect, but that never means you're not suspicious. And probably my favorite story of respecting the government um, comes from the Chafetz Chaim. So the Chafetz Chaim was of course the great righteous rabbi who died in the 1930s before World War II from Radin, Poland. He died in Poland. And of course, among so many other things, he was the great rabbinical light who brought um, who brought the the severity of Lashon Hara, of, of, of negative speech into collective consciousness one of the greatest contemporary rabbis of who ever lived. And one time, as the story goes, a Polish, or I guess it, maybe it was Russia at that time, I can't remember, um, civil servant came to the Chafetz Chaim's house. And of course, the Chafetz Chaim was immersed in learning Torah, of course, in his simple home, sitting at his rickety chair and desk, learning Torah and uh, totally absorbed. And the civil servant came in and he saw that there were 12 stamps, uh, postage stamps with the, I don't, was it the king? I, I don't even know. Mm. The, uh, let's see, what, what was it? It was the, I don't, what did they even have in the 20s and Thursdays, the 30s uh, in Russia, the, the or Poland, the, I don't know, the king or whatever it was. Um, and he had 12 postage stamps on his desk and each one of the 12 was ripped in the middle. So the civil servant cried out, how dare you? How dare you rip the face of, sorry, I, I'm, excuse my ignorance if it's king, I don't even know. How dare you rip the face of the king? And the Chafetz Chaim said, no, you must understand what happened. I had 12 letters that I was going to put in the, uh, in the postal, like, that I was gonna put in the postal post office, um, but because I had a friend who was going to the place where I wanted to send them, he brought them to the location and he distributed them to the various people. But because I was, because that was those that was going, I hope I get this right. Because those were going to be gone through the postal service, and I was going to like incur some some sort of profit for the government, and I took that away and gave it to my friend to send, I bought, I purchased 12 stamps and I ripped them so that the government wouldn't lose out on my giving my letters to my friend to deliver. So the purpose of that story is to say, is to say kavdehu, that a, that a Jew should be deeply respectful of the government, grateful for the protection that exists for our people and very, very careful to keep its laws. That's in the, the, that is in the Torah, that the Torah says that we are duty bound to keep the laws of the land, that we can't break the laws. Any religious Jew that breaks civil laws is doing a wrong thing. So we, we must keep the law of the land. And the Chavetz Chaim was so stringent and careful to keep the law of the land. But chadshehu, be very, very not naive that when society is suffering, it will turn on the Jewish people and never confuse uh, civilization for goodness. They are two totally different things. Never confuse culturedness with goodness. Never confuse refinement with ethics because at any given point, civilized man 
can descend into an animal and eat his fellow alive. Um, so I also, there's a few more things I want to say, and then I want to open it up to the group. Rabbi Hanina Sagana Kohanim Omer. So this is very important. Who was Rabbi Hanina? Rabbi Hanina was very, very pious, lived um, right around the destruction of the Second Temple, was very pious and was always the vice, like the, the deputy priest. Why? Because before the destruction of the Second Temple, things were very, very corrupt. And the Romans were basically giving the priesthood, the high priesthood, to like the highest bidder. So things were very corrupt, and even the Jews were corrupt. And um, hold on, Michael, one second, and then I'll take your comment or question or whatever it is. And and they were basically buying out the temple service. And so Rabbi Hanina was always the Sagan. Sagan means like vice. He was never the main Kohen Gadol, although he should have been because he was very, very pious and religious and learned. So he should have been the high priest, but he wasn't because the, the priesthood was basically being bought out. So why am I telling this? Because even though, A, it was tremendously corrupt, Jews themselves were corrupt, and in cahoots with the Roman government, which was terribly corrupt, even then, Rabbi Hanina, who personally knew that he should have been Kohen Gadol, not for his glory, but because for, for the Jewish people to have a kosher high priest administering over the Jewish, over the nation, of course, but he never received that role because it was very corrupt. And even so, it was him who said, you must pray for the welfare of the government. So th this is a rabbi who lived at a time of tremendous corruption. And yet still, he said, pray for the welfare of the government. Okay, Michael, yeah. I was just adjusting my seat, I'm fine. <laughs> Oh, your hand thinks so. Okay, fine. Yeah, okay. Um, so hold, I'm gonna say just a few more things and then and then um and then I want to open it up. Um so the civilization is skin deep, and we really need to always remember that. We also need to 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 be respectful, keep the law of the land. It says the Talmud says straight out, the law of the land, it the law of the land is the law. So we have to keep the law of the land. We are not allowed to break the law of the land. If we do, we're doing something wrong. And we um and we and we pray. But we don't pray because because we think that the government is necessarily great. We pray because it's God's, it's God's overseeing of the government that's ultimately going to keep us safe. So we pray to God, help, let it be that this government keeps us safe. So the, it also says in Jeremiah, something very, very similar in, mm -hmm. in, in the prophets, Yermiyahu, it says, seek, you probably heard this before, Seek the welfare of the government and pray for the city to which I have banished you. For in its welfare, you shall fare well. I'll say that again. Seek welfare of the government and pray for the city or pray for the country to which I've banished you. So a Jew has to always remember, no matter how comfortable I am, in America or anywhere else, I am in exile. So to a certain degree, even though I'm experiencing affluence and comfort, I have been banished here. And my role is to seek the welfare and pray for this, the country to which I have been banished. For in its welfare, I'll fare well. In its lack of welfare, I acknowledge that Jewish people are the first ones to be targeted. And in its lack of welfare, I recognize the thin line that separates civilized man from animal. And so I, I pray for the welfare of the government. And I pray and I and 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 that is my role. So I just want to end by saying that the I think you know it, it's interesting because two things. Two things are two things 
one thing just happened and one thing is happening. We just lost the Queen of England. And I, I, I don't know if probably a few of you agree with me. It's been very, very interesting to read what people say, to read, you know, what people are experiencing. But one of, uh, for me, the overarching thing that, that I'm reading is the word duty, that she had a sense of, of, of commitment, even at the age of 14 and, and, and then 24, she had, it, she had a commitment to something greater than her. And, and as a young woman and as a mother, she was very attentive to many roles, but always put the country first. And the sense of security, even though many people I'm sure had many critiques, but the sense of security um, invested in someone who was so committed to the welfare of the nation and really of the world. And, and that was really what the Jewish people, when the Jewish people prayed for a king and, 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 and because it wasn't, we, we didn't always have kings and it wasn't clear if it was, if it was the right thing to do or not the right thing to do. Did we want a king because we wanted to substitute a human flesh and blood king for God? Or did we want a king because we wanted to worship God, but man had gotten so unruly that we needed a person of flesh and blood to have the authority to kind of rein the Jewish people in, in order that they should be directed to serve God. So it was very like, it was, it was very questionable whether the desire for a king that ultimately wound up in the stage of Jewish history where, where the Jewish people had a king, some of the kings were great and noble like King David and King Solomon. And some of the kings were evil and led the people astray. But all the laws of kings are fascinating. One of them is that a, a, a king always had to have two Sifri Torah, two, two Torah scrolls, one to keep you know, behind and one to carry with him always. Just in case the king who had absolute authority became megalomaniacal and forgot that his role is to be servant of the people and not for the people to be his servants. So the role, the role of king plays a very, very big role in Jewish history. The idea that, that someone is truly lives in duty in, in service to the nation and with humility. And I think we did see that embodied in the queen to a great degree. It'll be interesting to see if the next generation and the generation after can uphold that degree of duty and loyalty to an ideal beyond their personal agenda. So it's, it's also a reminder that just like we pray for the welfare of the government and there's always different layers of meaning. If you read it carefully, it says, it says, have mitpalel b'shloma shel malchut. So here's another layer of meaning. Here's like the kind of deeper, quieter meaning here. Pray. Have mitpalel. Have is a, is a command. Mitpalel. Have mitpalel. Pray. B'shloma, that means for the shalom, shel malchut, of kingship. Now, we all know that in just a few weeks, we're going to be coronating the king of kings on Rosh Hashanah. The king of kings is the creator of the world himself. And the whole purpose of Rosh Hashanah is to recalibrate ourselves so and deepen for ourselves the understanding that there is a king of kings. And our whole life is about making our will closer and closer to his will, as it says in another, in another Mishnah in Perkei Avot, making our will his will. We're like plugging into the GPS of there is a king of the universe. Melech, you say that in the, in the breast blessing that everyone knows, Baruch atah Hashem, Melech HaOlam. So Melech and Malchut is the same word. Pray for the peace of the king. So this can mean, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it in a different way. Rabbi Hanina, Sagana Kohanim Omer. Rabbi Hanina, the deputy high priest said, pray that the world should become b'shalom with 
Malchut. Pray that the world should come to peace, to, to, to integration, to, to a unified understanding that there is one king who's king of all kings, the creator of the universe, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. For if people do not fear the king of kings, ish et re'ehu chayim bola'u, people will swallow each other alive. So on one end, this is Rabbi Hanina telling us, Rabbi Hanina, who suffered a lot from his government, telling us it doesn't matter what you think of the government, pray for the welfare of the government and respect the government and keep its laws, suspect it, don't be an idiot, don't fall for, don't fall for things that pose as, 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 as good when they're not good, but nonetheless respect and pray for it and be grateful for it. Because if it weren't for fear of the government, as Winston Churchill said, I, well, I wrote it down, Winston Churchill's famous line is democracy is the most, is the worst form of government except for all of those that preceded it. So, so we gotta be grateful. So pray for the welfare of the government. If people don't have a natural fear of an authority higher than them, they'll kill each other. They'll eat each other for lunch. But it also means, Rabbi Hanina says, pray for the integration of the crowning of the king of kings, that people should come of their own free will, of their own volition to crown the king of kings. For if, if people don't fear God in a, in a healthy way, not in a terrible, perverted way, but in a healthy and true way that there's one God who, who creates and sustains the world with love at every given moment, if not for fear of that, people will, will eat each other alive. And they do. And that's why to a certain degree, just to end, Rabbi Hanina's, this, this chapter from Rabbi Hanina is also a plea for Mashiach, the messianic, the, the messianic era, where the world will know the existence of the one God and the wolf will lie with the lamb. The lion will lie with the lamb. That, there won't, that we won't be learning war anymore, that nations will not fight and strive against other nations. So the messianic era is telling us that true shalom is when the world will know of the one God and the knowledge of God will flood the world. So on one end, this is about government. On another end, malchut can be, can be understood as government. It can also be understood as melech. Which melech? The melech hamalachim, the king of kings, the one true king, God himself. So this is really supposed to be taken on, on two levels and integrated on two levels. Um, and that's it. That, that's, that's our Mishnah. And any thoughts or anything anybody wants to say? I'm going to shut off the recording.